So my son's name was Neil Muir, and he was 34 years old when he died. My daughter's name was Lindsay Lee O'Neill, and she was 32 when she passed away. My son is Luke Martin, and he was 19 when he passed away. And my son is Tyson Hunter, and he was 19. My son is Chad Robbins, and he was 32. My son is Daniel Stephen Pollock, and he was 43. All so, of our kids had a number in yeah. Aurelia. In the days what do you mean? What do you mean by that? Yeah, it was from August till December, yeah. I believe. My son just died a year ago, November. Mm -hmm. And in that span of time, 25 or 20 more. 81 in the region. In I know that my son was 22. 20, yeah. That was his number. Yeah. That was his number. Yeah. How does that make you feel as a mom that your son is reduced to a number? Uh, not very good. <laughs> How many of your children had a history of drug addiction beyond something that was recreational? Did you know that they were using fentanyl? No, no, absolutely not. He didn't know he was using fentanyl. My daughter very specifically told me that she was very aware of the dangers of fentanyl and she was very afraid of fentanyl, so she would not have taken it by choice. How many of you sat down with your children to talk about the risks of fentanyl? The, the week before my son died, he was home. We watched the news every night, and every night I asked them to explain it to me. What do you mean? explain what it is. I didn't know what it was. So I said, please tell me what this is. And if you know what it is, why would you want to go out and get drugs and have the fear that it's in that drug? He says, you just take your chances, mom. And a week later, he was dead. Anybody else talk to their kids about it? You did? What did you say? And I told him the risks. I said, you have no idea what's out there nowadays. And I said, it scares me, and I, I really hope it scares you. And he always said, oh, I'll never do that, Mom. I'll never do that. Well, when it took us six months to get his results back, and there was marijuana in his system, and uh, fentanyl and heroin. How has fentanyl changed the drug scene? Now it's like playing Russian roulette. They're out there to kill you. The conversation is now about death. It's, it's not about... Yeah. behavioral or um, be a good kid, which is conversations we used to have, you know, I mean, you don't do drugs, that's not, you know, it, it, good kids don't do that. Now it's, it's you know, you, you've got to be, you're, you're, you're fighting for your life. I cry a lot, <laughs> every day. Um, it's only been a year. So it's hard. <laughs> and I look into my granddaughter's face and it's, thank God I have her. Because I have a part of my son, which is like good, but bad. I mean, she misses her dad every day. And she's just realized that daddy's not coming home. And I had to empty the closet <laughs> because his clothes just were there until just the last couple of days and I emptied his closet, and she hasn't seen it yet. So, it's gonna be a hard weekend. <laughs> he died of an overdose in his own home. In his own home, and my granddaughter found him. How old was she? Five. Your five-year-old granddaughter found her father? Yep. Yeah, so he had no. He was going back into rehab for the fifth time or whatever on the Monday. And the Thursday night, I believed he just wanted a last hurrah. They came right to my house, right to my mailbox, and delivered it. And took his debit card the drugs and went and got the money. The drugs laced with fentanyl. Fentanyl. Uh, it, there was no heroin in it. It was cocaine, fentanyl, and morphine. Delivered to your mailbox? Delivered to my mailbox. Do you know any other details about how he passed away that night? No. Just that your daughter Just found that him. he did it in the washroom and, uh, of our downstairs. And it's very close to the bedroom door. And he died in the doorway instantly. Seconds later. Seconds. Coroner said he didn't know how he even made it to the doorway. Because there was a, it hit him hard. 
And my granddaughter got up in the morning and just came to me and said, Nan, Daddy's glasses, somebody's going to step on them. And Daddy's got his head in the container because he was packing to go to rehab again. <laughs> and uh, he was, uh, she tried to open his eye to see if he would wake up. Oh, I'm so sorry. So she's, she's doing very well, except for now we're having trouble because now she's angry because now she knows he's really not coming back. So it's a struggle. And Maureen, your life has changed too. You also have children that you are raising now. Mm -hmm. I do, yeah. Your grandchildren. My grandchildren, my 11-year-old grandson and 13-year-old uh, granddaughter. They're now with you full-time, or how does that work? Full-time, yeah. I, I'm parenting. I take them to school. I make their lunches. I everything, their sports. It's full-time parenting. Do they understand? They struggle as well. I mean, um, my daughter went into the hospital um, with no life signs, and they, uh, much like other stories, brought her back, so to speak, and, and five days later she was declared uh, brain dead. Uh, the children were with us in the hospital the, the whole time. I spent the nights with her, and, but the children were with us the whole time. And, you know, when she, when we realized she was gone and we were saying goodbye, the two little ones reached across either side of the bed and grabbed each other's hand and uh, said goodbye to their mom. It was, uh, it was the hardest thing I've ever seen. to say there's a lot of emotion in this room and rightly so but when you go through the process of losing a child is there one emotion that penetrates through it all it's like you have a hole in your heart there's a piece that's missing that will never come back it is a physical hole yeah and we all agreed we all cry every day I think in the hill every day every day I see somebody walking down the street that reminds me of him. A song, Wish You Were Here, is, is was we did for a celebration of life. Every time I hear that song, it's Neil. But we also said, too, that, that when he died, there was almost like a peace, because I know he's safe. I know he's not struggling anymore, right? You can only die once. Anybody feel anger? Because I do see that undercurrent here. I'm angry. Oh, yes. <laughs> Very angry. There's a part of me, um, rightly, I don't know whether it's um, appropriate, but I'm, I'm mad at the system. Me too. That we failed. I feel that we are failing. We are failing our loved ones mm -hmm. and future generations and, and, and uh, young people, and actually not just young people, any age. And I think we have to really wake up. We have to get pissed off in order to get something done. We've got to get fired up about it. And, um, you know, for, for those of us who are ready to take that on, then we, I think, you know, I need to do this for Tyson. This epidemic of deaths is caused by murderers who yes, are adding yes. toxic chemicals to the drugs mm -hmm. that ordinary yes. people are taking. Mm -hmm. Do you all share that characterization that this is murder? Yes, yes. yes. Absolutely. absolutely, 100%. Absolutely. Who's the murderer then? Cartels, any black market, the pharmaceutical companies. Right. There are people profiting off the death of our children, and they're still profiting, they're still going to profit, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse until we wake up. Last week, there was a new drug announced in the United States. It was approved. It is 10 times stronger than fentanyl. It is the size of a tiny tablet, and it's for the convenience of use in the operating room. How long do you think it's going to take for that to be on the street? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have a problem with pharmaceutical companies inventing things that we don't need. There is no question in my mind that this is for profit, and the pharmaceutical companies are paying nothing for the, the cost mm -hmm. of dealing with this epidemic. Yes. They are the ones that should be for free supplying the, the narc the naloxone and the Narcan. Yeah, kids. and also rehab. 
like some and, kind yeah, of rehab and that. detox, the whole thing. Absolutely. Since you've sort of created yep. the situation, yeah. you are responsible. They're not. So what needs to change then? I'd like to see stiffer sentences. Um, I would like to see longer... Basically, right now, they, there's no accountability. Um, we know who sold Luke the drug, and um, he's still out on the street. And because of the way the laws are, um, that um, I, think, I think it's murder. And we need to start with that, changing, making the penalty for drug dealers stiffer and longer and harder for them, and also an accountability of whether it may for manslaughter. I really believe it's, it's murder. And right now, we have to make it difficult for them to sell. Because the way it is right now, they're getting away with murder. How many of your children also struggled with mental health issues? Not sure. <laughs> and do you believe that their mental health issues made them more vulnerable to drug addiction? Absolutely. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Did they get the support they needed fundamentally for the mental health issues before drugs became a problem? No. No. Did they ask for help? My daughter did, over yes. and over and over again. Asked for help with her mental health issues? Yes. And she didn't get that support? Uh, not, not anything consistent, not anything um, cohesive. Uh, no. The, 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 the mental health system um, is, is a bit of a tragedy. There's, there's all sorts of problems with it. Uh, my daughter, as an example, uh, admitted herself to the hospital to the psych psych psychiatric floor, um, suicidal, and um, telling her story uh, about, you know, laying in a tub with a razor blade, fully prepared to kill herself, and then thought through the result that that would be, which is the pain of her children, and so took herself to the hospital. They kept her for 72 hours. Uh, they sent her back out uh, into the streets with no real follow-up plan. There was no structure to how to guide her through her, her journey, which is addiction or mental health. I took my son to a psychologist. Um, I knew he was having issues and, and problems um, for counselling. And um, the very first appointment, uh, we met together with the psychologist. And um, she started asking questions, and I was sharing that Luke uh, was using marijuana and that I was against it. I felt it was um, not healthy. And her comment was, well, you do realize they're all using marijuana in high school. That's the age. I walked out of there, and that's the only thing Luke heard. See, Mom, everybody's doing it. She says it's okay. No, it's not okay. On the eve of my son's death, he, my husband picked him up from work. And um, it was just the three of us at home. We have four children. And um, it was unusual for it to just be the three of us. And Mother's Day was the next day. And he came barreling into the house. And he said, Mom, I don't have any money, but here's a... Um, tulip plant, he knew that's my favorite flowers and my favorite popcorn. And I said to him, you know, Luke, I don't need anything. Just you is what I need. So we talked and we laughed, the three of us all night. And one of the last things he said was, I can hardly wait to be a dad. I know I'm way too young and that's a long way off. But he said, I'm going to be a good dad, Mom. And I said, yeah, you are. And our last words were, I love you. And we had hugged and kissed. And I won't ever see his children. He didn't want to die. He had no, he had, did not plan to die that night. In fact, he was, uh, I went to wake him. I found him in the morning. And I was waking him because he was going to come to church with us. And he never woke up? At 7.42. I have a clock with his ashes in it. And the clock is forever stopped at 7.42. Because that's the day that a part of me died. We all changed. And um, life will never be the same.
it's it hard is. to say it's, that yeah. your son was or mm-hmm. your child was a drug addict. Mm-hmm. That alone is hard enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The stigma associated the stigma. Yeah. with it. I with, have always, yeah. though, thought, I am never, Neil's never going to be my dirty little secret. No, no, He's not. not. And I am going to speak my voice and be loud and proud because I was proud of him. He was a good person. Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. was a good person. Mm-hmm. These people that are dying are not not good people, That's right? right? They They're, make poor choices. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like we all do. Exactly. Toxic. Yeah. Exactly. We become exactly. a toxic society. Yeah. Yeah. Look, at, look around. Like... I had people say, um, you're not actually going to really tell people that he dri- died of a drug overdose, are you? Yeah. What? Like, yeah. of course I'm going yes. to. That's like, that doesn't right. define him. No. No. You know, and, and we've got to erase this stigma that society has that these lives matter. We no. can't just write them off because they have an addiction. Tell me about your necklace. That's my, my urn with Tyson's ashes in it. And it, uh, it's engraved with Tyson on it. It's a cat's eye stone. I, had to, I wanted to carry him with me, so. So did I. Um, <laughs> you have ashes in that too? Yes. And so does my granddaughter. She has one. Yeah, my daughter has her brother too. Yeah. Kitty cat. <laughs> my son was buried, there's no ashes. So this is my husband's original wedding band, which was broken, and a tiny little diamond inside it, which is Daniel, it's the star of Daniel. Oh, <laughs> oh I have a mommy all the time. Yeah. Oh, I have Luke's shirt, and I have other stuff too, but when I, I'll never wash, there were two favorite shirts, and, um, I'll never wash them because it smells of him, of his cologne. And I hug him when I want to wrap my arms around. And I won't get it back. Other Canadian parents will be watching this and wondering what they should be saying to their kids to protect them. What advice would you give them? I wish that they would listen to the stories of all of these kids. And if I think none of us will ever get to see our children again, our sons or daughters. We will never hug them again. We will never benefit from their future generations that they might be producing. A couple of you are lucky and have grandchildren. That they have to take into consideration the long-term impact on themselves and their families. That their life will come to an end suddenly, and it will not be because they wanted it to or they planned it. It's because somebody put something into a drug that they chose to buy that they didn't know about. 